Good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending on uh, the time zone that you might be tuning in from today. I'm your host, Todd Anderson. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Fintech Nexus. Uh, we got a great session ahead of us here today talking about alternative data and financial inclusion. Before I turn it over to my esteemed uh, panelists, a couple of quick announcements uh, for the audience. Uh, first, we encourage your participation. So if at any point you wanna ask a question and you'll hear me queue it up a few times throughout, uh, five minutes in, 10 minutes in, 20 minutes in, feel free to plug that question in the Q&A box. Um, if you have a, um, a general question about a video, about uh, another way to tune in, please use the chat for that. We try to keep the Q&A and the chat separate. So keep your questions in the Q&A box if you can, please. Um, also, thank you uh, to Provenir. Um, for their support. You've been longtime supporters and partner, partners of ours. Uh, we appreciate the continued support. So thank you uh, to the team at Provenir um, and to our esteemed guests. Uh, we'll do some intros here in a second, but we appreciate their time and effort. Um, and I see, you know, you might not see one of our uh, panelists there on the um, slide. Um, Al's been having some technical issues. So if he's not able to make it, we do apologize. Um, there is some some Wi-Fi issues that he's uh, currently trying to work through. Um, and as a reminder, as always, uh, fintechnexus.com, you can check out other digital events that we have, as well as in-person events. We have an event next week, uh, our Dealmakers event, uh, which is in Miami. Uh, and then we also have our large-scale 4,000-plus in-person event, New York City, May 10th and 11th. And now... Enough for me. We'll go around the room to our guests. Kathy, I'll start with you. If you could tell the audience a little bit about you and your role. Who's on mute after three years of uh, working <laughs> remotely. So apologies for that. So I did yeah. the same thing. So. <laughs> Um, I currently currently head up the um, North America business for Provenir, so all lines of business that uh, roll into me. Um, something interesting, I'm an identical twin. I have two boys, 16 and 13, so uh, working through those phases and absolutely pleased to be here. All right. Thank you very much, Kathy and Mia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I uh, am Mia Huntington. I'm uh, the executive vice president of our point of sale lending business at US Bank. Um, I've been in the payments business for about 20 years and, and really, um, I guess, business related something interesting about me. I've always been connected to growth opportunities. So in the various roles that I've, I've had, I really think more like an entrepreneur, I suppose, than a large corporate person. And I've had that, that ability to do that within the organization. Um, and, you know, when we, we think about customer expectations and how they expect to interact with financial companies like ours, um, I, I think that's particularly true of things like embedded finance, um, where financial decisions are really kind of happening in non-traditional financial settings. I'm, I'm really excited to have the conversation today. So, so thanks again for having me. Of course. And Erin. Thanks, Todd. Hi, everyone. So great to be here. Aaron Allard, I'm General Manager of Prism Data. Um, we are an open banking analytics platform that leverages deposit account data to uh, risk score consumers for lenders to help them make better decisions um, and expand inclusion and have kind of more accurate signals uh, once loans have been extended. Um, something interesting about me, I guess, following Kathy, also have two boys, a little bit younger, seven and nine, um, but similar to Mia as well. I uh, spent most of my career in the banking space always leaning toward more entrepreneurial opportunities. So really excited for the conversation today. I think it's such an important um, topic related to consumers and also helping lenders. So thanks again. Of course. All right. Well, you know, starting with the, the topic and, um, you know, start a bit high level just to, to kind of give the audience a, um, a sense of what we're talking about when we say alternative data. Uh, and so Mia, I, I'd be curious to, to start with you and then, um, you know, Kathy and Aaron, feel free to jump in. You know, when we say alternative data, um, are we talking, you know, cash flow, uh, bank account type data? Are we talking social media data? Kind of what are we are we talking about overall when we're focused on alternative data when it comes to you know underwriting financial inclusion? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Todd, and I think an important one for us to think about as as we go through the conversation today. Um, yeah, I would start at the beginning. 
I think whenever we're going to issue any type of credit and, and assess loan eligibility, we obviously, regardless of where you are in, in the ecosystem, you need accurate data, right? And you need models that really enable those decisions. Um, what's interesting, I think, sometimes for people that don't um, work in this space frequently, they may have this impression that, you know, not having a credit score or having a what we call a FIN file, it, it doesn't mean that you're not credit worthy, right? It, it might just mean that you just use cash a lot or you use debit or, you know, all of your credit history is showing up under your spouse's name based on how you applied for things. Um, and unfortunately, that means it also tends to be, you know, lower income, perhaps younger generation or, or minorities. So when we think about alternative data, I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, it can include things that are the not traditional things that show up in your credit score. So it's really any data that's not directly related to that consumer credit behavior and all the traditional kind of FICO score and Vantage score that we're used to. Um, it can be bank account transactions. It can be, you know, do you pay your rent on time? Um, do you pay your cell phone bill? Um, it really could include, you mentioned, you know, social media, it could go into that realm or it could include things like, you know, what school did you go to and what degree did you get? Um, so just using sources that are slightly alternative to just what traditional credit bureaus were able to provide, I think is really the, the topic for today. And Kathy, I know that, um, you know, Provenir works with lots of different lenders. Um, so how does um, or how do you work with these lenders when it comes to this type of data? And, and ultimately, how does this type of, um, you know, data uh, is it deployed uh, when it comes to different lending products? Sure, thanks for that. I'm, I'm just gonna take a step back and realize that I didn't tell anybody what Provenir does when I introduced myself. So Provenir is, uh, helps FinTech some financial services organization really um, uh, make faster, smarter decisions by unifying decisioning data and AI um, across the life cycle. So having said that, um, how do you deploy data? So really the data is often deployed in some sort of technology that ultimately re reaches the consumer. And in order to take action on that um, deployment, you really need a platform that can ingest this data. As Mia said, it's a wide variety of data. It comes to you in a variety of forms. And it often is very large in terms of the data set versus credit data we worked with in the past. And so you need to have a platform that is able to ingest large amounts of data, best in practice to be able to change out that data in, you know, within your techno technology platform. So using one data set, add data sets as data sets become available. And then through AI ML, really be able to use the insights of that data. So it's the insights from the data that drive um, the end decision that happens with the consumer. So being able to take that data and using AI native and fully integrated into your decisioning system, you're able to then inform models, um, look at different customer um, patterns of behavior, you know, really turn what technology can drive out into business insights so that you're able to better inform your strategies and therefore your customer experience or treatment of your customer across the life cycle. They're then often integrated into CRM systems, integrated to other systems where data is stored and, you know, other, other um, actions are taken with their data. Erin, as, as someone that works for a data um, provider, I mean, should we even be calling this data alternative is it used as frequently as say credit score data these days and you know how should we begin to think of this data beyond uh maybe calling it alternative data yeah it's such a good question todd because i think it goes to what is the this what is the this data right if if to mia's point if alternative data is this sort of mass bucket that's anything that's not the Kind of historically institutionally used um, credit scoring or credit reports, then you're talking about data that something like, you know, where did you go to college or something that's more social media oriented? Yes, I would say that is alternative. But if we're talking about things that are real financial facts, things like how much does a consumer make? How stable is that income? How do they spend their money? How do they save and how do they access that? that feels much more core and much more fundamental, certainly to how consumers make financial decisions, right? So if you ask, if any of us were to ask family members who maybe aren't in financial services, what they think about when they make decisions on 
buying a car or buying a home or taking out a loan, they're probably not thinking about things like, you know, what's my utilization rate or what's my average length of trade lines. They're thinking about things like, can I afford this? Do I think that my job is stable? Do I think that um, with the bills that I have today and the way that I sort of live my life, that I can make this, um, take on this debt or finance this purchase? You know, if you think about it, for many consumers in the United States, um, even more so than have kind of full file credit reports, their checking account is that sort of central vehicle through which the majority of their financial life is lived. That's where their money comes in. That's where they might use their debit card. That's where they pay their bills. And so when we're talking about the type of data that is really very much financial in nature, especially when it's consumer permissioned and kind of brought to the table by the consumer, I think that isn't alternative data. It's much more a completion of the data that, that sort of speaks to the consumer's life. Uh, we did have a, a question come in from someone in our audience. And uh, as a reminder to everyone in our audience, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom window and input those questions. We'll go ahead and throw those questions to our panelists throughout. Uh, the question came from Stuart. Um, how difficult, and feel free for anyone to jump in on this, is it to incorporate non-FCRA data into a credit underwriting decision in a compliant fashion? Um, maybe I can take a shot at that first, and then uh, Aaron might be able to to add some some color. So, from difficulty to actually incorporate the non FCRA data, and you know, if you have the technology to be able to do that and take it in its sort of native form, you can ingest that data right into your decisioning. Um, that can then be used to inform models, and and your decisioning is what would actually keep the compliance. So, what the compliant requirements are to make sure that, that um, your decisioning strategies adhere to that, whatever compliance um, structure that is. And I'm not familiar with what it is in detail, but then incorporating that data alongside your FCRA um, a data is often what happens in order to strengthen potentially a model or insights from the model to be able to address um, whatever decision you're looking for in underwriting. That was great, Kathy. And I'll just add in as well. Um, so, you know, coming from a bank background, I remember lots of meetings with regulators talking through consumer loan books and why decisions were made and how they were made. And it really goes to um, things like explainability, um, things like the fairness of the decision and things like the clarity of the decision to the consumer. And so I think about, you know, when you're building these models, um, to Kathy's point, ensuring that you have the data coming in in the right way, documenting the way that you're building your models, having, if you're buying something from an external firm, if you're buying a score or um, some insights or things like that, ensuring that they have solid model governance documentation and that it is explainable and it's not kind of a dynamically changing black box is really important. And then from the consumer access or the consumer standpoint, um, you think of adverse action notices. So when we were building things on our end, we had to be really careful. We came out of um, a company that was providing consumer credit cards um, under a bank sponsorship model. And so thinking through things like adverse action reason codes and ensuring that they're clear and understandable um, is a really important part of, of leveraging this type of data. So just making sure if you're building it in-house, you have all the sort of proper steps built in and documentation. And if you're looking for a vendor that they kind of understand what they're doing and have the right kind of support, whether it's from a raw data standpoint or the Kind of surrounding pieces is just really really critical yeah through the uh, first part of our conversation here we mentioned a couple of times uh related to inclusion and so kathy and I, I you know pose this question to you when we talk about utilizing this type of data how much can it potentially expand uh someone's customer base um and um that inclusion uh aspect Great question. I think it can um, have many ways in which it can expand the customer, um, the customer base, as well as, you know, really look at financial inclusion and addressing what, you know, is, has been traditionally an underserved market. Um, and the way you do that is a lot of the alternative data, and you heard, you know, Aaron explain some of the financial data that's available in checking and, you know, other things where a customer lives and breathes. So if we're talking about existing customers, 
Um, and, you know, Mia made ref reference to some of the other types of data, potentially lifestyle data, social data, there's, you know, there's that aspect as well. And in combining that data, you're often able to address treatments at a much more granular level, um, getting right down to what is that, what is your individual customer doing and being able to see patterns across a segment. So when you've got um, an AI ML model that is, you know, you're able to operationalize in real time, you're able to inform in real time, you're able to take the insights out and you're able to train and have that explainability, as Aaron mentioned, all sort of in a real time basis, you can use the power of alternative data, which often has much longer history to it. So you can see patterns that you may not have been able to see before, which can really help inform, you know, the whole risk portfolio, whether it's credit risk, fraud risk, you know, attrition risk, all sorts of risks that happen across the customer lifecycle. You really have the ability to see that. So you can use that to do targeted cross-sell upsell as an, as an example, meeting the customer where they're at and providing um, really tailored offering to them, which often increases adoption. You can use data um, in a marketing format. So if you're going out at a segment, you can look at what that segment's preferences are, how their spending habits are, you know, how they interact with their financial instruments. And again, putting targeted marketing campaigns out for, for increased product adoption in other product areas where they traditionally are not. Um, you can also use this data in the same way to inform your product roadmap so that your product offerings can expand and be more relevant and targeted um, to potential audiences that are there. And then from a financial inclusion perspective, not that any of that isn't inclusive financially, but looking at that underserved market, you're able to take data and with that history and behavior pattern and other data sets, you're able to actually make decisions that meet risk thresholds, both credit um, and fraud as you're onboarding customers that traditionally you wouldn't be able to reach and offer them financial instruments that they haven't had the ability um, to use in the past. And then you're helping them to, to generate that financial literacy and potentially adopt more products even within your own product suite. Me, I'd be curious to get your uh, take on the inclusion question as a um, as a lender and and what that might mean for expanding who you can lend to, um, maybe versus a, a traditional credit score and uh, the focus on that type of data. Yeah, I think Kathy's made a couple of really really valid points, and if I take it from the lens of you know a, a large financial institution, I think just generally speaking we should all always be reflecting on just how inclusive are, are our existing services and you know what are the areas where we can make improvements, right? And I think that's a lot of, of the topic that we're, we're on about today. Um, I think you're also probably seeing industry-wide, there's a lot of organizations that are really making public declarations around sort of purpose-driven initiatives. Um, US Bank is certainly in that group. And, and I think it kind of comes from three different places. I think it starts with employees and making sure that they have their own financial well-being. Um, it also then, you know, we've touched on just reaching those underserved or, or unserved entirely customer segments. And then I think part of the trust building comes from the financial literacy aspect of that too, where you know, you're ensuring that people, you know, really have that financial literacy that they require to, to expand and be successful. So, you know, the example I would give is, you know, U.S. Bank has launched just a number of initiatives um, over the last few years that are really aimed at expanding inclusiveness. Um, and that is, you know, things like we, so first of all, we have an access commitment that we announced in 2021 um, it's aimed at closing the racial wealth gap specifically through investment and lending. And we've got products like um, we have one called a simple loan product that enables customers to borrow up to $1,000 with really simple pricing structure, no hidden fees, which is often the subject of, of um, some of the concern here. Um, and, you know, I'll give you an example of that one, you know, since it was introduced a few years ago, the average loan amount is well under that thousand dollars. It's you know in the in the mid four hundred and I think it's four hundred and sixty dollar range. Um, so when when we think about all of the the topic that we're on about today, um, it it's really necessary to be thinking about alternative data when the credit score just doesn't tell the whole story, right? It's it's what you know we've we've talked about so far. 
some of the things that people are looking to buy today or the method in which they're using to buy it, and buy now, pay later is a perfect example of that, that traditional credit score doesn't often tell the story or paint an accurate, accurate picture of how you want to assess that consumer for the loan. So I think just from a from a large financial institution perspective, you know, that's really how I'm thinking about it is um, how do we use alternative data thoughtfully, making sure that we're implementing it in the right way and using it in our underwriting flows, but not using it for just for the sake of using it. And Aaron, I, I'd uh, love to get your thoughts on, um, you know, comparing the traditional credit score type data, which is is more static, to this type of data, which is a lot more actionable, and how much that can mean to a lender um, when it comes to you know ensuring that they're you know lending either more inclusively or just staying on top of their customers, offering them better products. How much more actionable is this type of data? I would say very much so. So, you know, certainly credit reports and credit scores offer a really important look at the history when it's available of the types of credits that are reported, which to me as point aren't all credits, right? What this type of data does, what, you know, cash data, bank account data does is show you, I think in a much more granular way, what's happening in the consumer's financial life right now and if you're monitoring it over time, what changes almost in the moment at which a change occurs. So we think about, um, you know, almost every day right now, we're seeing stories about layoffs, reductions in forces, things like that. For consumers who may have a thick credit file, may have um, a decent amount of savings built up, emergency savings, things like that, a job impact may not show up on their credit report for months, right? They sort of go to their savings, they spend through, they make their payments on time, and hopefully they get a job, you know, before they kind of run out. But if you're collecting cash flow data, which you can refresh, refresh daily, you'll see, you know, Aaron got paid every other Thursday at this dollar amount, and it didn't happen, right? You'll see it very quickly. You'll see changes in the way that a consumer spends. Someone who was, you know, for the last six months, very... Um, very good about putting money into their savings account every month is now stopped or is pulling money back or is spending in different capacities. So what we see is not only kind of on the upfront approval space, whether it's in the initial underwriting flow or from a second look perspective or something like that, more detailed look at the complete picture, including to me as point BNPL obligations and things like that. We also see kind of more importantly right now um, from an ongoing monitoring standpoint, a book that's already extended. So thinking about being able to manage line increases or decreases, pricing, um, collections, due date timing, all of those things that, um, that having just a, a bigger set of data and in some cases, a more timely set of data is really helpful for. Ideally, if you have both, you have kind of the total picture, right? But you think about this data as kind of filling in the blanks, both with things that just aren't included on the credit report or for, for consumers who don't have credit reports and um, giving a, a more timely understanding of what's happening in their lives. So it just gives, you know, more data and that enables to make more timely and better decisions for lenders. You know, a lot of, um, you know, fintechs have kind of been on the uh, front end of, um, you know, using this type of data. Um, you know, are banks beginning to, um, you know, shift uh, and um, shift their overall thinking and and beginning to you know kind of follow the the fintech lead. Uh, how are banks beginning to change when it comes to utilizing all different so sorts of data, but specifically in what we're kind of focused on here today, Mia? Yeah, um, you know, fintechs no doubt have been at the cutting edge and and have been for quite some time on on this topic. I think we're at a bit of a pivotal moment where banks are really evolving and understanding how this can fit into the existing bank business model. Um, and I think they have to. Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's how customers expect to interact. It's how um, the current economy works. I, I just I don't think it's an option anymore for for banks to say, no, this is traditionally how we've always done it and we're going to keep doing it that way. Um, you know, I, I can say from my own perspective, we've been quite deliberate in our approach. And, and I think you can probably appreciate um, there's some nuances between how a very large financial institution operates and, and a fintech, um, pro, pros and cons to both. Um, you know, for us, it was, there's probably a bit of an advantage to, you know, not being the first mover. 
Um, we're, we're a bigger ship, we're harder to turn. Uh, we've learned from what's worked in the market and what's not. And so sometimes we're just a fast follower as opposed to, to leading edge. And we really look to the FinTech success um, to, to guide the way. So again, I think FinTechs have really kind of blazed that trail. Um, but I think, as I say, banks, banks are starting to see where we can innovate in this area. And, and the other thing that we have to consider as a bank too is um, our use case can be quite a bit different, right? So our relationship with a borrower is often more broader and complex than say a buy now pay later loan that's gonna happen you know, at one time or with one merchant. You know, we have to think about the entire spectrum of, spectrum of our relationship with that consumer, which may have many facets to it. Um, we're not just offering a single solution at that moment in time. We really got to think about that, the whole um, consumer journey. So I, I think from, I, again, just to restate, I, I think banks are behind, uh, but I really do think there's this kind of this moment in time where, where most are realizing they have to catch up and be considering alternative data in their assessment as well. As a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom window to input those questions. You know, Kathy, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on kind of the, uh, the bank fintech angle as someone that works with both, um, both segments on, on kind of the adoption of this type of data and also on the, the product side in how this data enables some of the newer products that we've seen out there, whether it be buy now, pay later or others, um, that maybe traditional credit scoring would have not enabled um, to the extent that, that maybe we've seen thus far. Yeah, so I think on the overall question of fintech versus banks, I think just to you know echo what Mia is saying, I think that fintechs have definitely led the way with using a variety of data sources and incorporating those data sources to be able to um, reach you know a broader market to be able to develop products. Um, and they've also adopted the technology that enables them to do so. So they're not dealing with legacy technology. They're not dealing with you know having to Frankenstein or Band-Aid things. Um, you know, the ability to create it, you know, that it's in an agile format that is easily changed, easily adapted, and, uh, you know, allowing them to bring products to market quite quickly. Um, so, so I think that their, you know, use of data um, has enabled them to develop products like BNPL. And I think, you know, being able to ingest data and all sorts of data, financial, in other words, to give you an accurate, you know, full identity resolution, if you will, of, uh, you know, from the front door, from when you're coming in from an acquisition standpoint, you know, through, through the life cycle and being able to um, identify, you know, what the segment is needing out in the market, what gaps are there, ident you know, BMPL is, a sh is um, sorry, rather is a, you know, big example of that, how fast it came to market, how fast it was adopted, because it met a, a need in the marketplace. And it wasn't, and you find those with credit files that um, have adopted the buy now, pay later. And in the example that Aaron put forward about where we are from a macroeconomic situation, buy now, pay later enables cash flow, enables cash flow management, enables people to still, you know, um, take advantage of things that are needed in their, you know, everyday life, um, and they're managing it from a cash flow um, perspective. So it it covers a lot of, you know, the unserved, as Mia said, and underserved um, populations, as well as those that you know just want from a financial literacy a better way to manage their cash flow. And so you can talk about different generational adoption from that capacity. So. Um, I think that the technology has been a few, huge um, lever for the differences between fintechs and, and financial services. Although financial services are, you know, larger institutions, traditional banks, traditional lending institutions are definitely starting to make use of the data. A lot of the financial data that Aaron mentioned, um, being able to use that alternative data or non-credit bureau data to look really at what's happening now for the consumer. A lot of the traditional data that we've used in the past is backward looking or a point in time is only updated on you know, um, a certain frequency. But with these data sets, you're allowed to really look at what's happening right now. And that allows you to, as I said earlier, in response to a question, address the customer where they're at, prevent you know, um, 
prevent delinquencies, prevent potential fraud, prevent and address things like, um, you know, Aaron mentioned credit line increase, decrease, help them manage their financial, um, you know, constraints that they may have in given a macroeconomic situation. And I think, you know, we're, we're well out of the, the impact of COVID potentially, but I think we saw a lot of that need drives necessity and using the alternative data be able to meet the needs of the consumers. Again, having the ability to ingest that data, um, solution for that data, take insights from that data, inform your models with the, you know, um, readability, with the transparency and with the ability to use what's coming out of your models real time really drives that forward. We had a, a question come in from the audience. Um, they ask specifically what types of alternative data is used for a BMPL lending decision. I don't know if anyone has any example that you wanted to, to share with our audience. So I've seen examples of data sets come in. So depending on where in the life cycle at the adjudication point, there is actually a lot of lifestyle data. Um, for identity resolution, there's a lot of um, income data that not is not necessarily traditionally housed on the credit bureau. Think of if you're using a lot of, you know, if you have an Airbnb as an example that's regularly rented and there's a regular cash flow that comes in using some of the data that was mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, getting looking at checking account or, you know, other sorts of data sets where it can confirm income, look at those sorts of things so that they know. Um, they're able to, you know, in lending, as an example, and paying for um, the likelihood of actually paying in for. Um, and then I think what's powerful with BNL is a lot of those learnings from your first purchase of BNPL actually go back in and serve sort of what that behavior for a particular consumer is and starts to inform insights to potentially whether it's increasing the amount that you're approving for BNPL offering different products, you know, moving, you know, cross sell, upsell, and there's some organizations that do that. So there's actually a wide variety of data um, that is used to help in the BMPL process. We had uh, another question come in here, quite the uh, lengthy one, so bear with me um, as I go through this uh one here. Alternative data is all about risk reduction. And this is from Ryan in our audience. Uh, what are your thoughts on using alternative data to help borrowers maintain their credit slash stay current as opposed to upfront decision slash origination only? We can reduce risk upfront, but also after disbursement with all the alternative data. I'm happy to, to chime in on that. I think you know, one of the things that's really interesting is um, there's the borrower standpoint and the lender standpoint, right? So post disbursement, let's say you're thinking about um, an installment loan or, or a credit card or either way, um, you know, the money's out the door, right? And you're hoping the consumer is going to pay back on time. And there are some levers that you can sort of implement on the lender side to help them, right? But the faster that you know, and you have to assume uh, consumers might have more than one financial product that they're leveraging. So the faster that you know as a lender that there's a problem, there are a couple, and the more sort of clearly you know what the problem is, the quicker that you can address it. You can talk about things like um, modifying a repayment schedule or looking at a, a due date change or, or something like that that can help a consumer. You can talk about collection strategy that's much more um, consumer focused and keep an eye on what's happening Kind of in their life along the way. And if you know you're the lender who's sort of first at the table with that information, you're also the first one having the, the conversation with the consumer. So even going beyond the transaction, you know, Mia talked about the, the, the borrowers in her institution having maybe a broader relationship. It's a relationship building tool as well, right? Because you're the one who's sort of coming to the table saying, I'm here to help. Uh, we understand. And there's a real kind of emotional component to that for borrowers as well. They remember the providers who showed up more as a, as a human and as a, a helping force than the ones who sent the um, sort of very black and white collection letters to them. So there's a real way to be very pro-consumer about this and protect the lender's um, loan book and look at the, the risk management strategies as well. And I think it's just a, a very timely um, way to do that that this data enables.
Uh, we're getting some more questions come in. So um, if you uh, have any other questions, please um, input those questions. Uh, we'll get to them uh, shortly. I also wanted to ask about, you know, we've talked about kind of the innovation with that fintech has helped uh, enable. It's also, I guess, in some ways uh, complicated um, the way that you might look at someone's um you know, credit uh, profile overall when they have, you know, maybe they're using 10 different financial apps, maybe they're using all these different types of uh, checking or savings accounts, and they're trying to, um, you know, this this one has a good rate, this one has a better rate, and they're kind of moving money around. How complicated does it get with all these various products out there to get a really good picture of where the, the consumer might sit today um, if they're using lots of different products for lots of different reasons and their money isn't necessarily the exact same in every account or is, is not their full paycheck in every account. Does that kind of make things more complicated when it comes to a lending decision? Um, I'll take a stab at that. So I think, um, I don't think it it, it come, becomes more complicated um, if you have the ability to ingest all the data sets and to inform, you know, um, a model. So if you look at AI and ML today, it has the capability of machine learning to see patterns, to ingest data from a variety of sets. So it could be from every one of those financial instruments you've talked about. It could be a combination of that and lifestyle data and data from, you know, non-traditional income sources, you know, right across the board and everything that Kathy has out there available to these data providers can all be taken in and the machine learning has the capability to find patterns that are otherwise very difficult to see. And that's why, you know, at the start of this saying that you have the ability to ingest large amounts of data in a variety of formats, in a variety of ways delivered to you, and then allow the machine learning to find the patterns. And once the patterns are found, you can use them like you would any other insight. And it come, you know, creates a model that also is able to learn. And it has that, you know, the models have to have the readability and everything that's, you know, transparency and explainability. And, you know, but if you can deploy them real time into your strategies, it's no different than one data source, right? So it's the ability to pull all of that data together to create insights. And then those insights inform the decisions that you make, whether it's, you know, as we've talked about right up front acquisition, or whether it's a treatment across the entire cus customer life cycle. Um, so being able to do that, I think it's really important that a lot of that data, as we've talked about, is real time. So you need to be able to absorb real time updates to the data to stay current and to have the patterns current and then deploy those models um, real time into your strategy so that they can then learn from what your customer is doing. So you've made a decision at the front door, so to say, or a decision at any point in their life cycle. And you wanna learn from that and, and learn so that you can predict and recognize different patterns as it goes along. Um, so I don't think it makes it any more complicated, Todd, if you have the right ability to ingest the data sorts and to, you know, um, resolve or have a resolution of those data sets into a model that then has the actionable insights. So whether it's one or more, you know, more data equals more insights, right? I think I agree with everything you said, Kathy, and I think even taking a step back in order to have the data to ingest, the consumer has to be able to make the data available, right? So you think about, um, a lender who may not have all of the accounts in house that a consumer leverages. And so you think about the 1033 rulemaking and the open banking movement and just how, you know, it might be more complicated today. Hopefully in the future, it will be less complicated and much easier for a consumer to say, here are all of my accounts. Here's where I bank. Here's where I do business. And I, as a consumer, am choosing to share my data. And then Kathy, to your point, it's really incumbent upon the folks who are making credit decisions based upon that to have access to the right technology to ingest it and use it. But I think one thing that um, we've seen is uh, it's improving, but there are certainly instances in which a consumer may have three or four accounts, would like to share them all and can't actually get the data kind of into the system, if you will, into the aggregation system for us to be able to look at. So I think there's more work to be done there, but um, as long as the data is available, it's really about picking the right solution to, to leverage it.
Uh, we have some more questions that have come in from our audience. Uh, feel free to, to continue to input uh, your questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, how this one's from Ethan. How does the structure of various data sets and lack of data standardization affect the ability of banks or, or other lenders to utilize alternative data? I'm happy to take a stab. I think, um, and, and Mia, you may have a perspective as well, but um, you know, it's interesting because you think about the utilization of credit data and uh, substantially all of the data that's furnished to the three major bureaus that goes into those legacy scores is the Metro 2, the very sort of consistent format that's been used for a very long time. And uh, it's not the easiest format to work with for lenders who are starting from scratch or building their first loan book, but um, it's consistent. And that isn't the case in deposit account data. Uh, when I was in banking back in the day, we would do sometimes deposit platform conversions. We were a sponsor bank and we had, I think, 17 different um, deposit or prepaid platforms that we serviced. And the data, although it was for similar product types, was not similar <laughs> across the, the, the platform to platform and field to field. And so it's interesting because, you know, when we started looking at the data several years ago, um, most of the initial work that we had to do and that others in the space will have to do to use it is just thinking about how to make the data usable, how to dedupe, how to organize it, how to structure it, how to categorize it, um, not just functionally, because the first thing is getting it right. The first thing is really knowing the difference. My colleague likes to use this example of the dominoes on the transaction. Is it the pizza shop or is it the, you know, the, 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 the shop on the boardwalk in the sea the town that has the board games? You need to know which one of those transactions it is. And then on top of that, in order to use it for lending, it's the right type of categories. It's making sure they're risk weighted appropriately so that when you build those insights that Kathy talked about on top of them, that they actually are meaningful from a risk perspective and aren't so granular so as to, to introduce some disparate impact or, um, or other compliance concerns. So it's, you know, until or unless we have sort of a standardized format of leveraging this, I think there's really a need to have that infrastructure in place before you can even think about using it. Yeah, I think I think the way you just finished that thought, Erin, is 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 spot on. Um, you know, bringing these strategies that we're talking about today to market, you know, make no mistake about it, it is very complex to to get it right, right, and and get it going, and especially as you know, larger financial institutions and and some of the infrastructure we have, Kathy, I think you said this earlier. You know, it's it's there's legacy systems, right? And there's a lot of connections to each other, and and just getting that model right is part of the challenge, right? Although you might know it's the right thing to do, you might you know see it as as the future state. Um, it is highly complex to get it started and get it right. Um, so I, I think it's all about building those models, testing them, probably running them in a in a side by side kind of manner to say you know this was the expected outcome. We're, we're doing it the way uh, we expected to. I think that's a huge part of what a lot of banks are probably thinking about at the moment. Another one question that came in here, I guess it's related. So I'm just curious, um, you know, have, have you seen uh, behavioral data not related to credit history uh, be used, say like a, the person asks a, a potentially a, uh, some sort of exam or questionnaire uh, related to a, a borrower. Have you seen that type of data be used in, in lending? So um, we've seen some, some things, you know, um, that, that have come in. So, you know, I, I'm not sure specifically what you mean by psychological question um, or knowledge. Um, but there have been things that have come in from different behavioral data sets, and I refer to that kind of in the umbrella of lifestyle data. There's all sort of different data that comes in to create lifestyle data. And again, putting that into predictive models to be able to come out with a, you know, with a, a measurable set of how that impacts um, potentially, you know, all of the other data insights that you have and the predictive nature of that. And so what we're seeing with alternative data in the marketplace is, you know, we've got a standard curve of KPI predictions that come from traditional credit bureau data. And it's very easy to do that. You know, you're here, you're here, 
this is a point that we take you on um, uh, based on our risk profile. So we are starting to see some of that being mapped out with alternative data and lifestyle data. And so it's not been, I haven't seen it yet used completely alone to make a decision, but combined with other data sets, behavioral, alt data, um, non-traditional financial data, I think that it is starting to be used in order to um, onboard customers for a specific set of products. Another one in related uh, sense, which is, would you consider to use all different alternative data sources for a different age group from different consumer behaviors perspective? I guess it's kind of related to a uh, lifestyle in, in some ways, but um, do you see uses of different alternative data from different age groups? Um, I, again, I sort of across the board, um, I don't think it's specific to different age groups. You do have to make sure you're not introducing biases into your model predictions or insights um, that you, you know, obviously are adhering to compliance things, um, really looking at financial inclusion in, um, you know, in that I think what it comes back to is you can use some insights at an aggregate level to do things like the marketing, like the potential product development, like um, segmenting and, and providing, you know, certain products um, and meeting customers where they're at. So there are certain products that are much more relevant at somebody, depending where they are in their, you know, overall life cycle, they just get married or they're buying a car or they're buying a house. And, you know, there's that sort of um, meeting the customer where they're at in the lifestyle. But I, I haven't to date seen it um, across the board of, of institutions that we work with being very specific to age. Uh, someone did ask a question related to, you know, the, the credit bureaus, and I'll ask it a different way, which is, do you think we, and this is more theoretical, obviously, but do you think we get to a point where credit bureaus, either the, the score changes to incorporate some of this type of data, uh, or there's like a revamped uh, credit score as we move into these new types of products and credit bureaus are clearly trying to think how to report BNPL these days. Uh, but do you think the credit score changes dramatically sometime soon related to all these different types of data sets that we now have available today? I'm not a credit bureau expert, but I will say I don't think there's an option. I, I think they have to change. They have to change the model and the way the score is calculated um, and, and incorporate some of this data, right? So the question will be um, at what pace can they innovate to make sure that they are using the data and alternative sources of data as well in, in a relevant way? Yeah, I think of it as a, a when and a how question rather than an if, right? So um, I think there's no, no doubt that, you know, we've even seen um, leadership from some of the major scoring institutions talking in, in interviews about, um, in particular, cash flow data being uh, increasingly important in credit decisions alongside credit uh, data in the coming years. I think soon is a very interesting question, Todd. Are we talking <laughs> soon in our you know normal lives or soon in financial services? Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to see in what way it's included. Are they net new scores? Are they attributes that a lender can include? Are they um, changes to existing scores? There's a whole bunch of kind of downstream impacts in terms of uh, what scores and insights and attributes that lenders ingest and the time frame of modifying those and changing them out and, you know, uh, changing their own models. So I think there's a lot of thought to be put into place and in how they're deployed. But I, I, I believe, you know, at some point, hopefully on the sooner rather than later end, um, that we'll have a, a broader data set available in that way. We have uh, just a few minutes left here. So uh, if you have some final questions, um, please input them now um, and we'll try to get to them uh, before we wrap up. Uh, but you know, one area that we, we haven't touched on just yet that I wanted to at least uh, bring up before we did wrap is, um, is the area of fraud. Um, and uh, clearly fraud is a, a big um, component that uh, fintechs and financial services firms uh, all think about. You know, how does using this type of data help mitigate fraud? Is it better for potential fraud detection? Does it just give you more pointers of this is a good customer versus a bad customer? What is uh, you know, kind of your thoughts on, on how this impacts uh, the fraud question? Uh, 
um, I can take a shot at that. So um, I think that it, it, it helps. I think all data and any data that can be better, you know, better informed to what a consumer is doing um, helps. So I think that when you look at it right from, you know, the point of, of entry into your organization for whatever, um, you know, product service that, that a customer is onboarding, you know, right away up front, it can help with identity resolution. So there's a lots of different data sets that can really help to, you know, is Kathy who Kathy is? And there's, you know, it's been a long time of how do we identify an online or non-in-person user has been happening for, you know, decades now on how do we get there and using alternative data um, can, can really help you get there. And as we've said, um, there's also the history aspect and, you know, the granularity of the data to be able to help you detect patterns that are starting to happen. And some of those patterns, and Aaron gave some good examples, and we talked about the macroeconomic situation, um, but there's also very personal things that happen in, a per in, in an individual's life that can change pattern. And you can use those patterns to help understand and detect fraud risk and get ahead of it. The real-time nature of the data, the real-time ability to change and inform strategies, the real-time ability now available to, you know, change and train models. You don't need to take fraud models out of a strategy, you know, backward looking six months to train on data. You can do that real-time right now on your existing um, customer base and have behavioral models for net new customers and then incorporate those insights. So I think you can actually get ahead of see new patterns, identify new patterns, um, train your, your strategies and your um, models on that, and then be able to ingest data sets that may come up um, that are new indicators or predictors of frauds or the fraudsters have come up with a new way or a new type of fraud um, that can be then incorporated into what you're doing to help identify it. So I think it actually is, you know, as I said earlier, more data, more insights. I think having more data and alternative data available to you can really help drive um, um, your ability to both manage and identify fraud across the customer lifecycle. And as a result, probably expand your addressable market, right? Because you're not being so particular about just staying in your own lane with where, where it's safe. Um, it can still be safe, but expanding your audience. It just gives you a, a certainty, right? That you might not have without it of, um, yes, I may believe that Erin is Erin, but do I also believe that she's going to pay me back my, my first payment rather than sort of max out a credit card and walk away or make a payment and then walk away? So I think, you know, there's sort of the third party um, fraud aspect and there's the first party kind of early payment default. Um, what is my behavior going to be after you kind of open this account that you may not have serviced for someone before that this just, it points to maybe a little bit more specifically and giving that certainty, Mia, that you talked about to let lenders service people that maybe they wouldn't otherwise be able to have um, the, the data points to, to have comfort in servicing. We have just a, a couple of minutes left. So I always like to ask uh, as we wrap uh, just for some final thoughts, um, I'll go around uh, the room and then, then we'll wrap up. Erin, I'll, I'll start with you. Just any final comments or, or thoughts on kind of where some of this is, is headed over the next few years? Sure, thanks. No, this has been a, a really a fun discussion, honestly. So I think we're at a really interesting point in time where there's a lot of focus both from, you know, fintechs to major providers and banks to policymakers on how to make it um, more uh, simple and more accessible for consumers to get access to financial products and for lenders to make um, really accurate decisions with different types of data that are highly predictive, that are very sort of fundamentally fair and inclusive and also and allow them to make um, more precise decisions. So I think we've raised a lot of important questions here with maybe not concrete answers for everything of when things will change, but I'm really um, excited to be a part of the, the space and see what comes next. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And Mia? Um, I'll just pivot off of what Aaron said. You know, I, I think we're at a bit of a unique moment where financial services companies alike, and I, I would include banks and fintechs in that space, um, I, I just think we have this unique opportunity and we're really well positioned to open new markets. Um, we have to 
kind of, it's a balance, right? We have to balance shareholder expectations and financial returns and profitability, but also address societal issues, right? And I think that things like alternative data have allowed some of that to occur. And, and like Aaron, I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of that and, and working towards what a future state might look like. And Kathy, to round us out. Yeah, I think we have to keep having conversations like this. I think the um, consumers drive behavior of what you know financial services companies do. And I think that their voices are loud. Um, they have a platform. So I think we need to continue to challenge ourselves to both, you know, digitization is not going anywhere. Automation continues to be top of mind. And, and I think um, that all drives inclusion as well and financial inclusion. And so I think we need to keep challenging ourselves and our industries on how we reach out to customers, how we decision, how we um, adopt new technologies and new data sets and continue to you know, push the industry forward. So I think it's been a very valuable discussion and thank you for, for participating to Aaron and Mia. Well, thank you uh, to you and the team at, at Provenir. Thanks so much to Mia uh, and Aaron. Sorry, Al wasn't able to, to join us. Special thanks, obviously, to our audience. You guys had lots of great questions. So thank you. Sorry we didn't get to every single one of them, um, but we appreciate your effort as well. Thanks again, everyone. Check out fintechnexus.com for all upcoming events, both virtual and in person. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.